that went on that operation was under the command of a deputy superintendent of police and it had been approved. The operation itself had been approved by the director of operations at the National Security uh, Secretariat. I'm told, Honorable Chairman, that for this operation, they acted based on intelligence report that there were weapons in a building within the constituency where the by-election was to take place. They therefore mounted surveillance around the place so that they can stop the use of the weapons and if it was possible to retrieve the weapons without any confrontation, they would do so. They were to find that that building happened to be a building which was being used as the operational headquarters for the NDC candidate. So when they got there, they realized that some caution was needed before they were accused of having broken into the house of one of the parliamentary uh, candidates. So they were in the area watching how things would develop. While in the vicinity, and while they were conducting the surveillance operations, they encountered Honorable Sam George of the NDC who came in a car that I'm told also carried a deputy women's organizer of the NDC and another lady. They had been driven away from a polling station where they were escorted by 15 people on motorbikes. And this was in defiance of the interparty agreement that no motorbike should be taken to a, poli a polling station. So there was a little bit of confusion at that polling station. And we are told that it took the intervention of an elder statesman, the Honorable Oku Van Dapoy, who talked to Honorable Sam George, and Honorable Sam George left that polling station with the people on motor bikes. Honorable Chairman, my information is that when they left that polling station, they all rushed into that house, which was under surveillance. When the SWAT team later attempted to go closer to the house, the inmates started pelting them with stones. And later, they also said they heard gunshots coming from within the compound of the house. The, our boys then gave some six warning shots, which they tell me did not hit anybody. But obviously, I await the end of the investigations to find out exactly what happened and how many shots they fired and whether it did uh, hit somebody. For now, the commander tells me that the gunshot wound, one person was shot or had a gunshot wound, whether it was a gunshot wound or not, we can only wait for the investigations to find out. Um, they believe that that shot did not come from the warning shots that they gave, but probably 
the one from within the uh, compound. They do not even remember seeing any such person on the ground and that the person who was shot came from uh, that compound. But all these things, your uh, honorable, cha honorable chairman, we will find out the truth, hopefully, after the end of the investigations. Mr. Chairman, there is a special unit at the Ministry for National Security. That's what team we call it. And I want to say that it is not of a recent creation. It's been part of the national security architecture of this country for years, probably 20 years. It has uniformed policemen. And I'm told there were occasions where there were uniformed uh, military personnel and also uniformed personnel from the uh, immigration service. They also have some national security operatives who assist them in the discharge of their work. In recent times since we've been there, the team is made up of policemen and some national security uh, operatives. I believe the number of policemen that we have today is about 25 uh, of them. But as I said, there always has been a SWAT team. The national security operatives who support them, who help them, are part of the national security operatives, informants that we normally employ. We have about 1,000 such operatives in the country, and they are deployed all over the country. They do some guard duties, essentially. And you will find that if you go to most of our installations, um, there will be some guards there. They are part of the national security operatives. There are some at the harbors. There are some at the airports. There are some at, the gov at various government uh, offices. As I said, you know, we have 1,000 such operatives deployed all over the country. Mr. Chairman, about 100 of them are based at the national security headquarters. And they normally assist the police team, the SWAT team, as we call them, on patrol duties. And they also help the police to provide rapid response to security challenges. These 100 people will normally join the police to undertake uh, patrol duties uh, in the night and in the day if the need arises. On that Thursday, the SWAT team, I'm advised, deployed 60 men comprising 25 uniformed police uh, officers and 35 national security operatives. They were under the command of a deputy superintendent of police, Mr. Kodu Azugu, who is the commander of the SWAT team.
Madam Chairman, as per our standard practices, the national security operatives are not allowed to hold weapons during operations. And I'm advised that on that Thursday operation, the operatives did not carry guns. On the other hand, all the uniformed policemen who were part of the operation were armed. Chairman, for any operation, the commander, the deputy superintendent of police, will obtain the approval of the director of operations at the National Security uh, Secretariat, who is a, a military man, in fact, a colonel, called Colonel Opuku. So the team that went on that operation was under the command of a deputy superintendent of police and it had been approved. The operation itself had been approved by the director of operations at the National Security uh, Secretariat. I'm told Honorable Chairman, that for this operation, they acted based on intelligence report that there were weapons in a building within the constituency where the by-election was to take place. They therefore mounted surveillance around the place so that they can stop the use of the weapons and if it was possible to retrieve the weapons without any confrontation they would do so they were to find that that building happened to be a building which was being used as the operational headquarters for the NDC candidate. So when they got there, they realized that some caution was needed before they were accused of having broken into the house of one of the parliamentary uh, candidates. So they were in the area watching how things would develop. While in the vicinity, while they were conducting the surveillance operations, they encountered Honorable Sam George of the NDC who came in a car that I'm told also carried a deputy women's organizer of the NDC and another lady. They had been driven away from a polling station where they were escorted by 15 people on Mutu. Minister uh, in charge of uh, Minister in charge of National Security, the Albert Kandapa, earlier speaking at the commission, uh, who's uh, who's set up, well, which is set up at the castle. Um, former seat of government. So one of the key things that have come up is a bit of, uh, if you like, inconsistency. But is it inconsistency or is it just a difference in report? I still have Adam Bona here, security analyst, so we can continue with that discussion of what uh, has actually, you say, brought the nation to a standstill because a lot of people are listening to this, watching this, following this keenly because it is about our security. So let's look at the report. I mean, we have the benefit of high tide based on the fact that uh, the Minister of State in charge of security has also spoken. So we can put the two side by side and begin to look at the trend and see if we're, we're some way, somehow we're satisfied. By the way, what, uh, what Mr. Kandapa says concerning um, the, the warning shots, 
as we go along, we will play that video and then we'll have you talk to us about it, whether or not it is possible that warning shots were fired and that those one it's possible for them to know that the warning shots that were fired by these men did not injure anybody because that is the report. But let's look at the reports that they both uh, uh, mentioned. So um, earlier you were indicating that the national, both of them has said, one of them has said national security is investigating this. The other said police is investigating. What we know, which is in the public domain, is that police is investigating this. Is this worrying? To what extent is it worrying? It's worrying because then, even at this point, there is lack of coordination. The national security, one of its prime objective, or, or yes, what one of it is to coordinate. If you go into their own objectives, mm. what they are supposed to be doing is to coordinate. So if among themselves there's lack of coordination, then because then in one breath, the now we know Brian Achampon is supposed to be his deputy. He's contradicted his deputy, his deputy has contradicted him. Mm. That is that is worried. It means that there's lack of coordination among the two of them. So uh, that is the the spillover is what we saw as I uh, was mm. West Wogo. So it's possible that one person has issued a directive, or there is some kind of operation going on, but it is not an institutional operation. Exactly. It, it's it's you know check it operations going yes. on here and there, and 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 like you're saying, the spillover is what we're seeing is what we're seeing here. Is the commission? and the exercise that it's embarking on now, the antidote to this problem? I think it is, because you can see how embarrassingly uh, we have uh, some of our states, uh, some of our leaders contradicting themselves. Mm. For me, I think a lot of lessons uh, will be, would be learned. A lot of lessons would be learned. If you look at the former Inspector General of Police, mm. he had to educate Brian Achampo mm on their limits and how things must be done and he said this openly in a televised tv i think uh, you know on your network mm. that even in australia this is how it is done even and then he brought it back to the uk i mean the sas that is the the dreaded dread what do you call it mm. SWAT team and they come in but they have to you know go in together with the local police and as we talk about that are you also West Wagon comes under the East Legon police station or either the Legon police station but unfortunately mm -hmm. uh, none of it did we see in terms of liaison with them so for me probably we we have heard the police say they are banning vigilantism so probably we have a former vigilant vigilante group within the national security secretariat that must be banned well, they, they, I, I heard uh, Brian Chumpel say there's nothing like that. But I'll have to interrupt this briefly because there's something interesting happening in Parliament that we need to bring to your attention quickly. Uh, we understand that the House is about to take a decision on a member of Parliament for Asin Central, Kennedy Ejapon. Um, the majority le leader, uh, there he is. Um, I'm not quite sure if he said what he wanted to say already, but we can cross over quickly and briefly and come back to you, Lord. looks like we've lost that feed. Let's continue with our discussion now. And Mr. Bonner, so well, that's one part of the inconsistency. Another thing that we've seen, which you pointed out to earlier again, is the fact that they're mentioning some names here. We know now that um, one Azugu was in charge of operations on that day. We also know that one Kennel Opoku was in, is in charge of operations. Is a military officer. Is a military officer. Is in charge of operations for this special group. But you have some concerns about about that. Is it just about the inconsistency? Because even though the minister uh, minister mentions it, the minister of state in charge of national security, Brian Echampon, says he would not give names. He indicated not long ago. His boss gave a name. What is happening there? That's what I'm saying, lack of coordination. Okay. One of their prime objectives is to coordinate. The other security agencies share intelligence with them. And so if amongst them, there's, they, you know, are given different uh, views or, you know, of what they think mm. happened, then I'm afraid to say that there's lack of coordination. And you, you also look at it, you have a SWAT team. The SWAT team is actually under the command of the IGP. Mm. It's under the command, it's not under, the national security was not established to have, and so that is an illegality. Mm. There is no law establishing national security that is supposed to be carrying firearm. This is a convention that is illegal, that is unlawful. 
And ordinarily, how do SWAT teams operate in, in, in um, I mean, elsewhere? How do they elsewhere, do SWAT, standard practice? SWAT, SWAT teams, j just like the former IGP, they say, mm. you go in with the police. I mean, they, the SWAT team can be made up of different agencies who are trained properly, mm. but it must be under the police at every, every time that they move. At every time that they move, they would have to be under the command and control of the Ghana Police Service. But unfortunately, we did not see that. And once that didn't happen, they realized we have a bigger issue here and there. And so, as far as I'm concerned, uh, short teams also don't go into operation and back off. Mm. But what we saw, they, they went in, I mean, we are, SWAT teams don't even go into, let's say they're coming into, what do you call, uh, Joy FM, mm. to come and conduct an operation. They, first of all, would have to lay, know the layout, have an idea of how many rooms, what they have to have an idea of what is going on. And when they come in, because they know there are some weapons or something in there that is so bad, mm. they don't retreat, even if it's a month. They stay there till you surround her, you come out, or they blow out, they have to blow off the, the building. And so for them to have gone there, and we are told that the people... But this was an them. election. So this was an election. Is they it? had to stay, and they had to make sure that they get ac they have access to uh, the, the so-called... Uh, so why didn't uh, they do uh, that? Ammunition. No, why didn't they do that? I mean, my, my point is that if indeed they had weapons in that building mm. and you went in with, we now know there are 25 police officers as whether all of them were deployed. You went with 25 police officers, you went in with maybe some national security operators. 35 national 35. security 35. So why didn't they stay there? If indeed what you are doing was of a good cause, of course. Go in the let's see. The bottom the line, the bottom line, the point that the national security, the, uh, the ministers are making is that they were confronted by these men. That they that they they they, they got confronted by the men, and so they had to call for backup so of so backup of backup of sort. They didn't. They didn't. They, they didn't call for any backup. Backup came from where? But My point is that uh, who confronted them? People confront you with. They pelt you with stones. Where were they supposed to be there? And that's why they had to use the My, my point is. Well, I mean, do you shoot into the people? Do you shoot into the people? And we are now hearing that uh, uh, the, the looks like uh, those who were running ended up shooting among themselves and shot people who were running. And so uh, if, if, if I am this way and I'm running towards that direction, I'm shooting, I can't turn the weapon and shoot behind but, me. But the minister said nobody was shot. Even though there were warning shots, nobody was uh, shot in the process. You see, that's where the is that something that you are inclined to believe? No, no, I don't believe it. You, why not? I mean, we we I mean, we saw everything. I mean, it's, it's, it's there. It's video. Do you believe it? Did you believe it? I mean, I'm asking you. Do you believe it? I don't believe it. It's not true. There were people who were shot at. Some of them are still in the hospital. People were shot at.